Hello, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm with The Optimistic American, and I'm here with Natalia Baker. Uh, Natalia is a immigrant from the Ukraine. She has uh, been on the Phoenix Fire Department, and most interesting, what we're going to talk a lot about today is a new business that she started. We're going to talk about the difficulties of starting a new business and how it is that you make it work and why it is that you'd even start one. What are the motivations behind that? Again, I'm Paul Johnson with The Optimistic American, and we're here to talk about hope. Natalia, welcome. Thank you. All right. So tell us just a little bit about your business. We'll come back to it. But what's the name of the business and what are you doing on it? The name of the business is Stretch Plus. Stretch Plus. Yes. So we create an environment for people to come in and have um, basically a movement education where we we, um, ask them questions and... um, make an assessment we help them stretch we give them homework to stretch at home basically and there will be other aspects to it you know like breath work where somebody would be teaching them how to breathe the yoga poses where they would be teaching them that aspect of it as well and the basic purpose of this business would be to create an environment for people who already do this stretching education to work there as their own business and kind of a co-op which is not yet here in America so much. And then for people to come in and get a good stretch and where somebody helps them and does it for them and uh, educates them on how to do it at home to make it a part of their life. All right. What's the name of the business again? A stretch Plus. Stretch Plus. All right. So what I want to do now is I kind of want to go, I want to do the Natalia story, uh, how we got to this business. So um, if you don't mind, go back for me. Let's let's start with uh, you back in 2007. You moved here from Ukraine. Is that correct? Yes, 2007. 2007. Okay. So tell me about what life was like in Ukraine and why you left and why you came here. Mm-hmm. That is a long question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what life was like in Ukraine? I tell you, Ukraine is beautiful. It's a magnificent country. It's so beautiful and wonderful in so many ways. We grew up in Kiev is a city, but actually I most of my childhood I spent just outside of it in the village with my grandma. And it was so amazing because it was just us and I had a pet chicken, you know, and we had all these other animals and rabbits and garden and we would plant potatoes and um, we had an orchard, you know, so it was like a wonderful way to live and a wonderful way to grow up. Then I moved to the city and I went to school over there and it was again it we lived very poorly right so whatever we planted that year is mostly what we ate the whole winter and uh, my mom was a government worker all her life my dad police officer and they divorced when i was very young so life was very hard financially but we never felt it because there was so much nature around us there was so much just wonderful things we could do that didn't involve any your backyard was beautiful the the village house yeah. in the backyard was amazing and in the city you know we just always were outside playing it was great however we were poor mm-hmm. you know i remember my mom would buy uh, a chicken carcass that was already picked off the meat mm-hmm. and but you buy the carcass because it's cheaper so you can make soup out of it and we would eat that for seven days in a row mm-hmm. you know or sometimes it'd be like two days before paycheck what should we get you know <laughs> for the last like two dollars and then you just make it work. But it was great. It was amazing. So the country itself was wonderful. The way we grew up, you know, we just had limited resources. Did you know that at the time? Or did you were you just a kid thinking that's how life was? At first, it was just a kid thinking that's how life was. And I, I loved it. It was great. Mm-hmm. Then later on, you go to school and you see how people live differently, you know. And unfortunately, where I went to school in, in many other places there, people would treat people differently because of how their money status is, you mm-hmm. know. It's unfortunate, but sometimes it happens, you know, there. Um, but I believe it's gotten way better it's, since then. So there was a hierarchy in terms of uh, who got to participate and who didn't? Is that what you're saying to me? Mm, well, I tell you this. My teacher of English was yelling at me and told me that I would never speak English Mm -hmm. because I was not her favorite student because my mom was not bringing her a lot of things and candies and flowers into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So she said to me, you will never speak English, you know? How did that leave you feeling as a child? Did it leave you feeling lesser than or were you just able to overcome it? 
Hmm. I would say that it made me feel pretty bad as a kid. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're there, what, 10, 11 years old and some teacher tells you this, right? Mm -hmm. It's a place of authority. And uh, so it kind of doesn't feel good. But I tell you this much. There was another teacher, teacher of English. She was so good to me. She was so good to me. She pulled me right through. And, uh, the, and uh, lo and behold, English, I had better grades in English than I had in Ukrainian. Wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so is this in high school or grade school? Middle school. Middle middle school. So you go to high school, and then I know that you went to college, but you got involved a little bit in politics, at least involved in uh, uh, at least involved in the election enough to be concerned about who was going to win. Yeah. So I was um, I was getting my education in Ukraine, and I was studying small business management economics in one of the universities in Kiev. And uh, be right before I came here, there was a revolution back home, the first, the Orange Revolution. And we were all a part of it, especially as students. You know, you always want to be involved. What and was the Orange Revolution? The Orange Revolution, the basis of it was that people did not want um, another pro-Russian president. They wanted somebody who is for Ukraine. They wanted somebody who's pro-European. They wanted somebody who would uh, defend the interests of our country not create another Soviet Union. And people, I remember like now, uh, people came out to the streets and it was the most wonderful thing because it was so uplifting and so amazing. Did and you feel like you were gonna win? Or did you feel like you wouldn't win? We knew we were gonna win. Okay. There was such high spirit on that street. It was amazing. And we were doing, um, we as girls were doing the kitchen. So we would feed the people who were protesting there. We would go to the protest and help out over there too. And we spent a good chunk of our time there. And it was amazing, amazing to see. And then we also got involved in the more of the process as we would go to elections on the east side of the country and monitor so that it would it would go well. And so we would go from this party, a political party, right? And they would send us to monitor, make sure nobody's cheating or doing anything because there was a lot of that as well. Mm -hmm. So did uh, did the old government, the Soviet government, feel more oppressive? Oh my gosh, yes. The and, only thing they do is oppress people. I in swear what to ways? God. In every single way possible. Even look at Russia now. This is a great example. They have no Instagram. YouTube is about to go away. McDonald's closed down. They closed everybody who doesn't agree with them, who doesn't do what they want to do in the way they want it to be done. So you're a poor girl. We were poor. In a in a country that is that is oppressed by Soviets, and you're having an election and you decide to get involved. You decide that you're going to try to do something about it. It, it had to be a little bit like the taste of freedom. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. It was. It, it felt for the first time like I could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I swear to God, I remember that feeling, and I want to carry that all through my life in many different ways. Mm -hmm. All right, so you win. Is that right? Oh, my goodness, yes. Tell me about the election night when you won. Well, I remember elections. They went. Everybody went there and put their papers. And the next day, our candidate won, and it was it was amazing because it felt like you matter mm -hmm. as a person which I think in Soviet times, you really never did matter. Mm -hmm. And even after the Ukraine got independence, it was, still was very shaky because the country was so broken down, you know. And so now it, it finally felt like you make you can make a difference, you know. Even you as a little person and a student can make a difference in something. And then, you know, like I said, our candidate won the pre-European and then he got poisoned and you know, disfigured. And it was, hor it was heartbreak. Do you remember? Heartbreak. Yes. It's and were, uh, were people, uh, it, was there a lot of loss of hope at that point in time? Yeah. So it felt like, it felt like, mm, I would say that again, it felt like no matter what you do, you cannot win because the oppressing forces are so great, but so, people had hope. I find what is interesting, what you're saying is, that uh, that there was a sense that you didn't matter in the Soviet Union. I remember I went to Poland in 1991. Uh, it was a great opportunity. I, I was asked to help them establish their first local governments, and um, you know we all knew that this uh, that communism theoretically focused more on the collective and not on the individual. And certainly they didn't focus on the individual, their rights. They didn't have their rights. They didn't have the ability for freedom of speech or freedom of assembly or 
or uh, freedom to pick the church that they were going to go to or the synagogue or the mosque that they might go to. Um, but even worse, um, you know, they're at that time, literally, this is 1991, um, they had no sewer treatment plants. They had no scrubbers on the tops of the smokestacks. The pollution was so bad, you couldn't even live in the cities. The 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 big, beautiful buildings in the, of the 1930s had so dilapidated because no one fixed them up. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't understand how they could even argue that helped the collective. It seemed like by harming the individual, they did harm the yeah. collective. Yes, they did. Mm-hmm. Because all they were concerned about is the power. Mm-hmm. Power that the government has over people. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter whether the people are happy or not. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter if they had food or all of them were wearing the same brown jacket, you know, or you had to stand in line like I did with my mom to get a half a pound of butter and a half a pound of sausage. And that's all you got. There's right. only one kind and you get only so much of it. So you decide to come to the United States. What makes you make that decision? What was happening in your life? Well, like I said before, I got uh, finished with my college mm-hmm. or university, I should say. What and was your What was your degree in? Oh, small business management okay. and economics. Oh, so you like business, even in small business management and economics. Yes. Okay. And I tell you this much, I was just thinking about my teacher of economics because I'm taking economics class right now. Uh-huh. This was this small Soviet man. And I remember clear as day, I tell you, he says, business is evil. All the evil in the world happens because of the evil business. This is your professor? This is my the business economics <laughs> teacher in okay. a school of small business management. Uh, uh, so Soviet, it's ridiculous. Yeah. All right, so, so you decide to leave. What's the motivator? Well, I was, you know, 21-ish at the time, 21 at the time. So um, I, you know, got engaged, met a boy, got engaged. He was from here and um, we decided at first to come visit because his uh-huh. mom was sick. So we came to visit uh, here. And of course, I think, like I said before, many times to many people, once you see this country, this is amazing. You know, there's I've never seen anything like this in my whole life. You know, it Do you was, remember when you first got here, you're right from the airport to wherever home was? Yes, yes. I remember it so vividly. I remember it was, like I said, end of August, maybe mm-hmm. middle of August. It was hot. It was so hot. It was middle of the night. And I remember I came out of the airport and it was like in the movie, like in those Western movies, you know, that sometimes you would see on TV, the air is melting. <laughs> you know, it was amazing. And then you're like, oh, this is interesting. You go into the car and then I remember the road home or to my fiance's house. Mm-hmm. It was about 30 minutes and we started driving and I was like, oh my goodness, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's at night, you know, Mm -hmm. so we're driving on the freeway and I see the road. One is there, is the road, right? (laughs) There is a road. It's beautiful. Uh I didn't see one pothole in the whole road. It was just asphalt, like brand new. It was amazing. And then the lines were all there. It was so beautifully marked. The little markers that were blue in there to show you which way to go. It was amazing. They had markers on the road. Can you imagine how much work they took? Stick everything <laughs> every so often. And they were all there. I swear uh, to God, I looked, they were all there. And then I look up and the, then there's this, you know, lamps on the side to the make lights. it lighter. Yeah. Every single one of them had a light bulb. Every single one of them had a light you bulb. So that is unique, huh? I was, I was in awe. Uh-huh by the time we got to the house. And this was at night, driving on the freeway. That was enough for me to be like, this country works. This is amazing. Yeah. It's functional. It's amazing. Yeah, perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had perspective. All right, so uh, you get there, you make a decision that you're going to stay at some point. Mm-hmm. What makes that decision? Was it your family? Was it a job? Was it the fact that you love the country? What was it? I do love the country. I did love it. Um, a lot of it was that my former husband had a mom and she mm-hmm. was very sick and he also had a much beloved dog who was amazing and it, w- it didn't feel like the right time to move mm-hmm. and by the time we could move, it, we already had the child so mm-hmm. it didn't make sense. But you see this country and you know this is a good place to raise your kid, mm-hmm. you know, like as a mom or a future mom, you know, you're like, I want my kid to be here, mm-hmm. you know. Why? It's just so amazing. There's everything for kids. I swear to God, the other day I took my kid to the dentist. Mm-hmm. 
I so embarrassing because I almost cried. You know, my kid is in the chair doing her thing. Dentist is doing her thing. I'm sitting here crying, <laughs> tearing up. I'm like, I can only uh, imagine if I grew up like this. You like, I cannot explain this to you. You go to the dentist here. And, and, and they're like, oh, my God, how are you? You look so wonderful. I love your hair bows. And the kid's like, oh, thank you. And then they give you these glasses. And then you lay down in this beautiful chair. You lay down. And, of course, there's TV there. Which show would you like, they ask? This, this, or this? And then they're like, oh, which, which what is this, some kind of thing they give fluoride? Uh-huh. Of which flavor? Oh, which flavor would you would you cut on candy? Oh, what's your favorite thing? Chocolate? I know it's. I was crying. <laughs> I was like, if I grew up From like this, <laughs> I uh, could have been so good, you know. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot believe I, how grateful I am that my kid can have this. Instead, you could have gone to this office of a government hospital where there's this big machine. And then there's uh, 12 metal arms coming out of it. And they give you no medical um, anesthesia because there's a shortage or maybe somebody took some home, you know. And then they go like, and then forever, forever you are scared of dentists. I swear. All of us Eastern European people here in the Valley, U.S. Kenny dentists, we're the worst patients. They have to knock us out unconscious to do anything with us. (laughs) Okay, so your daughter, has she become Americanized? I mean, obviously she has. She was born here. But do you see differences? Oh, she's so American. It's amazing. Uh-huh. She's an American kid, I swear to God. She's, yes, she's all American. She's American. She loves, you know, burgers and just so cool and so free. You know, she has this free spirit to her. It's amazing. Yeah, it is a uh, it is a great place to raise children. So mm-hmm. uh, she's mac and cheese and playing on playgrounds and all the things that American children would do. Yes, burgers, mac and cheese, um, lots of outside, you know, time. We go to the lake we go to playgrounds she socializes with her friends just like regular kid which like to everybody here it's like normal right but to me i mean we couldn't even do any extracurricular activities like i want you know like i wanted to do gymnastics that Mm -hmm. was only for rich people you know you cannot do any of this and only for rich people yeah Mm -hmm. or people who have money you know like i remember having a printed piece of paper was like Oh, it's a printed. I'm not going to write on it. It's so cool, you know. <laughs> we used to write everything by hand, you know. And here, you can have it anytime you want. Yeah. But yes, yeah, she's so, you know, she's so lucky. I tell her all the time to be here because we grew up, we bought one pair of shoes each for in September. By the time November, mid-November, they already started on glooming. Then you glue it and then you tape it. And then you just hope to make it through January and, you know. Well, January and then March, right? Yeah, January, no, February, February, March, yeah. Yeah, February, March. You just like hope to make it and then you glue it and it's like not working. You know, it's horrible. Mm-hmm. Here, she has 15 pairs of shoes. She can go and do anything she wants. She can go buy anything she wants. It's amazing. It's a country of abundance. I say it's a country of opportunity, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. here truly you can you can find any opportunity you want, mm-hmm. right? And you can make abundance. You can have it if you want it. Or mm-hmm. you can have whatever else you want, mm-hmm. you know? All right. So you, uh, you're you here with your family. Did you decide to become an American citizen? Yes, but it did take a long time. How long did it take? So it took me 11 years to get to that point. Tell me about that journey. Was it hard? Was it difficult? Was it worth it? Um, Worth it, yes. I think so, yes. Um, but I will tell you... Um, I I love my country of Ukraine, right? So it was really hard for me to even think about giving that up, Mm -hmm. giving that citizenship up. But I have seen so much good coming out from people of America that I truly felt like I belong there after 11 years of being here. And so many people were so kind to me. And Mm -hmm. so many people helped me in so many different ways and all the turbulences, you know, of these last 15 years that I went through. And then for that, I just wanted to... I just wanted to be a part of this country because mm-hmm. I see how good people are here, you know. But it took me 11 years to get there. I could have had it first three years or something like that. But I, I couldn't do, I couldn't with my whole honest heart stand there 
and say what you need to say in the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Mm -hmm. But I got to the point where I was there, and then I did it, and I'm happy I did it. It wasn't too difficult. It took about nine months. Do you remember the day when you were sworn in? (laughs) Yes, I remember. I used to work for fire department then, and all the guys from my station came there, and they were there watching me take an oath, and it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. Mm. The uh, I I saw a clip on that. It was a great clip. Um, mm. You with the uh, fire department guys, Phoenix Fire Department, mm-hmm. which I'm always proud of, just simply because I was the mayor of Phoenix a long, long time ago. Um, all right. So you uh, you become a citizen. You said that uh, one of the things about people is that a lot of people were willing to help. Any stories that you recall of people <laughs> that helped you? I don't even want to start. There's uh-huh. so many stories. I don't know where to start. I'll be honest with you. There's so many, uh-huh. so many, every single person. Yeah. I mean, we moved out when I got divorced. It was not a very pretty divorce. Uh-huh. And we moved out, basically kind of ran out, you know, with just a bag of clothes, if anything. No, just whatever was on me and my kid. And I tell you, these people, well, this one church, they helped me to find an apartment to live. One, there was this lady who housed us for two months. It was amazing who would do that. Then this church helped to find this apartment to live in and move out on our own. This is at the time I didn't know what APS was or how to sign a check. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was so new to everything. And then people that didn't even know me started bringing, bringing things like forks and a mattress, you know, and a cup and like all these things that I need for everyday life that I had no way to get. You know, mm-hmm. it was amazing. People that didn't even know me, mm-hmm. you know, would do that for me. That was so amazing. And then there's so many more things like that, you know, like people in the fire department, they would teach me how to be a soccer mom, you know, for my kids. And then they would teach me about the tires, you know, and how you need to do this and what is this. And they teach me so many life skills. It's amazing. Like I forever will be grateful for that place. It's so good. There's so many good people that work there. All right. So... Um, the Ukraine. Do you still have family members there? Mm-hmm. My whole family is in there. Right now, they're in Kiev. They're in Kiev. My mom, my dad, my sister, and my nephew, and my niece that are little. Do you talk to them at all? I do talk to them. I talk to them over an application on of the internet, and um, I talk to them almost every day to check in. Mm-hmm. You know, As you know, it's war there. It's really bad. Mm-hmm. And uh, are they... Uh, your mom, you told me, I think, was still working. Mm-hmm. She works. She works um, She works really nonstop. And she's retired now. She doesn't have to be there, but she does it because she believes in a common victory and that everybody has a peace and everybody has a job that they can do for the benefit of everybody. So she helps out to keep people protected in shelters. And none of them have thought about leaving or evacuating. They're going to stay throughout. I asked them. I asked them before the war started. They asked them now and I asked them almost every time I talk to them and they refuse. My mom refuses. She's like, this is my country. I was born here. Everybody else can go. Yeah. But I will stay here and I will make sure those people are safe. But this is Ukraine. This is how Ukrainians are. Uh-huh. We're like that. We will do everything for our people, for the common cause that is good. We give the shirt off our back, you know? Yeah, that's obvious. How does it feel emotionally when you're watching... Uh television today on this it's nerve-wracking i would not lie first first four days we could not none of us here that are from ukraine could sleep or eat or do anything you know we would go to these rallies to help out we would find the ways to help each other and talk to people and you know just contribute somehow to the to to the victory right I mean, it was hard because you know that it's like a piece of your heart is being ripped out and you could not do anything about it because they're ruining your country. The beautiful, beautiful country, years and thousands of years of history, they're just bombing it, stomping it down because they think they're better or they want something. And the whole family can disappear in one day, in one 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. right? The whole family, all your relatives. Mm -hmm. It's nerve wracking. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I think someone said uh, we're all Ukrainians now. I remember John F. Kennedy gave a very famous speech, each being I am Berliner, I am a Berliner. And I think, uh, you know, I think back to those days when that happened. I was certainly, I was just a very, very little boy when that happened. But um, I know that my mother and others, they were they were driven by it. 
I think Americans today feel much the same way about Ukraine. I feel like, I think that we feel like they're on the front line of liberty. They're on the front line of uh, trying to protect us. Um, so the, uh, all right, so I want to go to the business. Mm -hmm. So you have to know that half of all American businesses go bankrupt, right? That it's Even difficult. more than a half. Yeah. Yes, first and five it, years of existence, right. um, about what, 70% of businesses go out of business. And so, and you're taking your money and your time and your effort and you're investing it all into this business. Tell me what's going through your head when you do that. Hmm. Well, there's many things that go through your head and sometimes you cannot sleep at night, you know, because the thoughts of how better can it be keeps you up, you know, how you can make it better, make it better. But I tell you, it's um, I've been getting ready for this for a long time, right? So I had a business before that too, and it worked well. It was great. I had, you know, learning ground on that respect. And then I study business right now. I go um, to community college for associates and go into ASU next coming year for my bachelor's in business and then marketing as well. So it's, um, it's a process, you know, it didn't just like I wake up today and I decided this is what I'm doing. I'm going to do. No, I've been reading books uh, so much. I've been reading so many books. I've been talking to so many people. I've been mulling around in my head this idea, you know, how can I make it better? How can I get ready myself for it? And finally, everything got to a point where I was able to say, okay, it's now or never. We're doing this. And then you start. And then you start. And then somehow, as amazing as this country is, things just happen, you know? Things, people help you. And I've met so many amazing people that already helped me so much. And these are people who are so good at business that I could never afford to pay for their time to ask them advice. But they do it. For, you know, do it out of the goodness of their heart. You yeah, know? There is something to it. You put, you put the idea out into the universe, and I believe it's amazing. In that. Oh, me too. And it just starts to happen, doesn't it? That is so true. That is so true. You know, I like I believe in God. You know, I believe in universe and energy too. You know, I believe that what you give out to the world come back to you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why it's good to be a good person. You know, that's why you care about people, and that's why you do the best you can. And Sometimes you learn and then do better later. Okay, so what excites you about the business you selected? Why, I mean, why this business? Why did you pick it? This business, well, ever since 2012, when I got my personal training um, certificate, I was amazed at the human body and what it can do. You know, I was amazed at how it has ability to heal itself, how amazing transformation of body can change everything about the person everything you know it can change their total life explain that to me i don't when you say it can change everything how you, does it change everything think about this i will give you an example of how a limit in your body can change your life like you have grandkids right i have grandkids can you and imagine kids. your grandkids sitting on the floor and asking pick me up and you reach down and your back hurts so much as spasms and you cannot do it and you know now that you're going to be in bed for a week not able to go to the play that your grandkids are doing, not able to pick them up, not able to even get up or do anything for yourself. Debilitating. It's debilitating. What I am here to do is to complete opposite of that. To give people, to teach them how to use their body, how to um, help their body heal so that they can do things like that. So they can be there for their grandkids, right? Mm -hmm. So they can um achieve better things so some people have bucket lists like i have a bucket list right and some people have a bucket list many people do of going to grand canyon rim to rim for mm -hmm. example right you cannot do that with your body not cooperating right mm -hmm. so you get your body ready you prepare it and then it's the physical aspect physical challenge and overcoming the physical challenge and your ability to do so that opens a new level in your mind and i truly believe it mm -hmm. because body mind and soul are connected right if one out of sorts the other two are suffering right so if your mind is great and your body is not cooperating doing anything you will get depressed eventually it will affect you in many many ways so we're here to take care of that aspect of the body, right? To make people's lives better through movement, through movement education and just teaching them how to facilitate the healing process in their body. Say, for example, you know, take a, like, okay, I take me as an example, right? 
not so not so long ago i was you know just kind of wrestling what to do what to do with my life what to you know where am i going what is this happening this was a few months ago this was august you know maybe somewhere in there i'm going to school it doesn't feel like i'm doing what i should be doing i'm not in my right place and it's kind of started to be depressing a little bit right so i thought okay it's time for reset you know i went to, to ukraine to visit my family to see my nephew my niece back before the war started obviously and i saw where it came from some of it was not a pleasant sight what do you mean it was sad to see we came out of a bad neighborhood and i saw it with my adult eyes of where we came out of it was not pretty by any means you know and then i come back to america and i say we need i need to do something so in all the books that i read the similarities from all the successful people that i went through biographies say they read a lot they meet with people reevaluate what they do and they exercise so i started running i got the running coach i started running and in 3 months i was able to get ready for my first ultra marathon Ultra this one was 52 miles in the Strayer Mountains. Mm -hmm. Now I made a mistake and I had to redo the last 13 miles so it was a little bit more than that. But in any case, the preparation for it is what changed my life even in these 3 months. It made me so much better. So I had to structure my time right. Right? Now I work on time efficiency. I have to do all these tasks, tasks, work, kids, studying, running, big amount of time. Now I have to pre-plan it. Now I have to buy the right tools. I have to get in touch with the right people. Now I have to plan my day around things. I have to do training, testing, different shoes, different things. You try and see what works. You see what doesn't. Do the time management better and better. Read the books about it. Understand the subject better, right? Meanwhile, you're running. Now you're running and something happens. You learn how to overcome it. Now you're running and your brain acts up on you. You learn how to push that through, right? So you constantly through the physical exertion work with your brain and it takes you sometimes to some dark places. Mm -hmm. You hit the wall and you hit the wall and then you learn how to get out of it. I remember this one time I was running and I made, you know, like a couple of mistakes I didn't fuel enough, you know, I was still trying to figure it out. And all I wanted to do is sit down on the grass and cry. I just wanted to sit down and cry. And I was like <laughs> two miles from my house, you know. Yeah. And and then you go back and you're like, okay, brain, hold on. You know, what are we doing here? You start working with it and you make it by pushing through that challenge physically, you push through a wall mentally, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you will never be the same person again. Mm -hmm. never will you be the same you will be better and bigger and this is why i say that the physical can affect mental ability so much mm -hmm. yeah i ran uh, rim to rim to rim a couple of times mm -hmm. and I, I like to hike the canyon it's one of my favorite most spiritual places but i remember uh, the first time i did it i when i got to the one rim i thought there's just no way i can make it back i just can't do it and then everybody who I was with left the door and started to go back the other direction. I thought, well, okay, I got to go do this. And somewhere around the top, I mean, I just was, everything was crashing. Carbo yes, crash. Yes, I was having yes. a, uh, you know, I, I started to get cold chills from uh, hypothermia because it was so cold outside. And I laid down in front of this fire in the, in the lodge there. And I remember this kid came over and he said, hey, I know you. You're the mayor. And I said, and I didn't get up. I just said, yeah, kid, I, I was the mayor. And he says, do you, you care if I take your picture? I said, kid, you can do anything you want, but I'm not moving. So I've got this picture that he took. You sent it to me with my head between his feet. Okay. It was like I, I was done. There was nothing left. But I thought I was done at the other rim. Yes. And Just when you think it's over, you have a whole bunch of more energy to go. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. But don't you feel so much better that you finished it? Oh, absolutely. Don't you feel like you're at the new edge of possibilities? Mm -hmm. And you can never go back. Mm -hmm. You could never do less now. You have to push more. Uh -huh. Right? Absolutely. That's It's amazing. All right. So business has some of those similarities, but let's talk about that for a second. So you decide to go into this business. Tell me what you think, uh, without picking out any group, what do you think that is, that's not happening in the industry that needs to happen? What's the existing industry doing wrong? I would say from what I saw in businesses, and it's really businesses of all sorts, mm -hmm. is that they worry so much about the bottom line, about the numbers. That they don't they, put the customer first. 
They don't even put the people who work there first. Mm -hmm. They don't put anybody first, just the numbers. Mm -hmm. And they do what makes sense for the numbers. Mm -hmm. And they don't do what makes sense for the business or for the for the people that work there, people that go there, you know, people that um, are customers, right? And it's completely backwards from what it should be. Mm -hmm. Every successful business that you look at, if you look at the biographies of and read the business books, every like Patagonia, right? Take Patagonia. Everything they do is about uh, doing good for environment, doing good for people that work there. People are happy to work there, you know, and the business does great. Mm -hmm. It comes together. But sometimes, and sometimes I see this in franchises or big companies, you know, that people are so worried about making money that they forget why they're in the business. Mm -hmm. Because every business out there starts out for doing something good for people. Mm -hmm. They're doing... They're trying to do something useful. They're trying, trying to, to fix make a problem. Yes, fix mm -hmm. a problem, make things better. And then somehow it gets lost and they forget that that's they're there to serve people. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're not there to take, they're there to give. Mm -hmm. Right? And they forget that. I want to bring it back. I want my business. It's not even going to be my business. I'm just there to facilitate so other people have place to work, right? It's nothing to do with me. I just want other people to have a great place to work and people to have a great place to, to help with their body and the problems that they have. Right? Yeah, one of my tests, I own a healthcare company. We employ a lot of primary care providers. Um, my partner is uh, absolutely brilliant at it. Uh, he's a, a provider as well, but he's a very good business person. Um, both of, I have two other partners, uh, a male and a female, a guy named Dr. Berg and uh, Dr. Janice Johnston. Um, but in any event, the, uh, uh, the thing that we see, the first thing that we'll ask a primary care provider when, or any doctor when they're talking to us about what they're doing, we'll say, okay, so uh, look out the front of our building. They'll say, yes. You see those spots that are right up next to the building? They'll say, yes. They say, those are our customer spots. All the covered spots are the customer spots. Oh. All right. Now, when you can go back to your doctors, and tell them you're going to park the farthest away because we're going to put the customers first. Then maybe we can help you. That's amazing. Right. And they, it, we almost always get the same answer. Well, that we don't see how that's possible. We, we couldn't keep doctors. Well, then the doctors have the wrong thought in their head. Yes. Right. You have to put the customer first. And that's the beginning of everything. And if you do that, if you if you culturally train people so that not just the it, once the provider sees it that way, guess what happens to the receptionist? She sees it that way as well. Yes. And now all of a sudden, when somebody's walking through the front door, she has eye contact with them. Yes. She talks to them. If she remembers their name, she mentions their name. Yes. If they sit for too long, she'll go out and apologize for how long they're sitting or he will and tell them, hey, we're sorry it's taking so long. Can I get you something to drink? Once you begin to put the customer first, mm -hmm. everything changes. Mm -hmm. Everything changes. Yep. yep. And you can't help it but make money because, because it's good. What you're doing is good, mm -hmm. right? But you have the right idea. And I wish more people would think like that. Mm -hmm. You know, customer first. They say it, but how many people act it? You, you, you have to not just act it. It has to it has to, you, you have to be obsessed with it, with every single fiber of your being. Yes. It has to be the number one driver yes. for why you're there. Because thousands of decisions come up in a business and you have to constantly say, well, okay, um, how does this affect the customer? All right. So we come up with a rule or a regulation or a process. And the first thing that you have to ask is, how does this affect the customer? How much mm -hmm. time are they going to have to wait? Mm -hmm. How much longer will they be in a lobby? Mm -hmm. uh, it Will this make it easier for them so they can spend more time at home with their family or other mm -hmm. members. All right, so in your own business, what are the keys to your branding? What do you want for your business? How do you want it to be branded? How do you want people to see it and to think about it? In my business, everything we do revolves around loving the customer. Mm -hmm. This is what I told my customer this morning. We we'll, we we'll just love our customers mm -hmm. genuinely, right? And so this will be translated in everything we do. You know, I want my business to be to be simple, simple for customers, simple for us. And that would leave so that it would be, how should I say it? Very efficient. Right. So everything we do would make sense. It would be simple. There's no confusion, no crazy 
you know, things you have to sort through in pricing and things like that. It would be just simple. We're there to help you. What's the best way for you? This, this, or this. That's it. You know, you want, we we'll don't tie you up with any kind of, sim, you know, crazy membership that you have to sign up for whatever, you know. We're just here. We know you're going to come back because we mm -hmm. know we're good at what we do mm -hmm. and we care about you. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's what I want people to know about. You know, people on branding oftentimes think it's the logo or it's the website or it's the slogan that maybe you have. And all those things are important. They play a role in it. Mm -hmm. But it really starts with the heart of the organization. It starts with uh, what do the founders care about? What is it that they're trying to drive towards? And I love I love the word love, right? Because it it when you use it, when you're willing to take that extra step and say, I love my customers, mm -hmm. I love my employees. Mm -hmm. That is putting a, an additional burden and responsibility on you. Yes. You know, if, if we're giving care to uh, someone who needs their, their back fixed, that's very different than if we're helping our grandmother with yes. her back or our father with his back. Um, what begins to happen when you love them is you go the extra mile. And it's that extra mile that begins to create a brand of quality. You know, when, when you look at the brands that people know and that they think about, it's because, it, it, you know, Apple isn't Apple because they have an Apple in their logo. That's not why, when, when people think about it, that's not the experience that they have from it. And that's true with every great brand, right? We used, uh, you know, if you use the, the you know, a, a Tesla versus, a, you know, an IKEA car, right? Tesla has a different brand, but it's not just that it looks different. In fact, if you actually start to look at the cars, they kind of look similar. It's the heart that came from the founder who wants to try to change the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, what in our business, more than anything, we build relationships, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you care about people, you build relationships, and it's amazing. And from then, you can change people's lives because nobody cares how much you know if you don't care about them, right? Mm -hmm. But once they know we care, you know, they trust us. And then it builds a relationship. And from that grows change in both people's lives, right? And particularly like in the customer's life, we're interested to change. And it's funny you say Tesla and um, Apple. Those are the two companies that I look up to mm -hmm. so much. Not because they're so successful and they make so much money, but because the people behind those brands we're so unreasonably out there, unreasonably. Mm, they were maniacal about. Yeah, like their I like product. the word obsessive. They mm -hmm. were they were unreasonable. They mm -hmm. were totally unreasonable, and it was amazing, mm -hmm. right? It mm -hmm. was amazing. It was totally out of this world. They questioned the whole premise behind how the car should be. They questioned the whole premise behind how the phone should be. You know, mm -hmm. and when I met. Um, uh, Hardhawk um, company and Frank, it was amazing because I thought, oh, all we need is a logo maybe, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. And then he's like, whoa, whoa. We're not even, we don't even know who you are. Like, you don't even know who you are. How mm -hmm. can you have a logo? And I'm like, yes, you're right. What am I? Mm -hmm. What is this company? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just a place for physical stuff, like where you go and maybe, I don't know, stretch. It's more than that, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, think about it. Body, human body is the most beautiful, magnificent machine ever made. Ever made. Mm -hmm. Nothing come close to it. And we're just there to help it function better, mm -hmm. you know? To hit the reset button, to to get it to the original settings, mm -hmm. you know? That, that is what we're there. We're not there to mess with it. Mm -hmm. We're just there to bring it back to where it should be, you mm -hmm. know? But it all comes out of place of love. First, we need to know who we are. Mm -hmm. And now I see that now. You know, you used a key word, transaction and relationship. Um, the It is very easy in business to see people as a transaction. Yes. All right. The I, I need you. I need you as the human being to become the raw materials so that I can fill out my code to get paid. Yes. All right. Yes. That's a transaction. A relationship says the code is second, the patient is first. Yes. What I need to know is what do you need and how do I help you? And begin with yes. Don't begin with no. Begin with yes. Yes, we can try to fix this. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can work on this. And if you do those things, it it makes it harder, but you also begin to build a brand around it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It definitely is not the easiest way, mm -hmm. right? 
that's the thing is the easiest way is just number next number next mm -hmm. we make it a production right but look at this we all want to be happy mm -hmm. people who create company want to be happy people who work there want to be happy and people who use it want to be happy mm -hmm. But people are wired for relationships. Mm -hmm. They're wired like that. Just as humans and animals, we're a pack animal. We mm -hmm. need relationship and we need our tribe. So the only way people can be happy as a customer, as an owner, or as people who work there is if they're a part of something bigger and better. Mm -hmm. If they build a relationship within and if they build a relationship with the world. Mm -hmm. And then they will be happy and fulfilled. It doesn't come from how much money you make, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't come from any advertising or anything, you know? It comes from 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 the relationship that mm -hmm. you have with these people and that you truly know that they care, you know? So today, your business, are you operating out of your home? Are you operating out of a garage? How, how are you operating today? We have a location in Scottsdale where it's opened. Okay. Yes, recently, and um, we're still, it's a work in progress, uh -huh. right? So, Is this your first location? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. it's our first location. And, and, and so you signed a lease on it, mm -hmm. and so now you know you have a payment to make. Mm -hmm. A little stressful? It's funny you ask. Uh -huh. It was stressful right before it started, uh -huh. right? It was so stressful. Of course, it was at the same time as all my exams came in yeah. and everything else I had to do. It was stressful time. Once I open the doors, first three days, we make enough money to make rent for two months. Good for you. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, it's a, uh, um, were you, before you signed the lease, fearful? Yes, I think, I think um, I was, um, how should I say it? I like to make risk, but I like calculated risk. Mm -hmm. I calculated it enough to the point where I knew I was going to make it. Even if I didn't sell anything, I hedged my bets to the point where I can give this a try and be fully protected from financial standpoint. So it was more, um, I would say, exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every entrepreneur has to go through this. Every entrepreneur yes. has to go through making the first sale. Every entrepreneur has to go through taking, you know, signing the first deal that yes. puts them at risk. It's all part of the equation. Um, now you, uh, you make a decision to do this. Why? Why not just work for someone else and do this? I keep asking that myself too. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I keep asking that question for a long time. I just, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I wish to know more, yeah. you know, but I think, I think there's something in me that likes a good challenge. Yeah. And there's something in me that cannot be bored with the same job all over time again, you know? And the only way to get this challenge is to push it. And the only way to push it is business. Really, mm -hmm. right? Because in business, you never know what that's going to be like today, mm -hmm. right? You don't know if you're going to have an amazing day and you're going to be on the page of the best magazine ever or you're going to have a flood and everything's just going to go. You yeah, know? I'm, I'm hearing all the right steps. I mean, I'm, I've definitely been involved with mentoring a lot of uh, uh, young entrepreneurs. And the beginning point is you have to have some faith and belief. You have to have an idea of yes. what you want to do. And then the successful ones, listen to the customer. Yes. Well, if you listen to the customers, the business model that you start with might become a different business model Completely. because you hear something from the customers that you say, okay, they, they don't want this. Yes. They want that. Yes. And you start to evolve the product. You start to change the product. You have to take risk in there somewhere. And I don't know what the keys are to being an entrepreneur. I mean, I, I don't know what what makes someone an entrepreneur. I know things that you have to do or that you should do. First, want independence. Yes. All right. To not to not work for someone else. Second, to own what you create, to believe that you want to go create your own thing, to mm -hmm. make it happen. The third thing that is important is you have to have a um, – sometimes an, an, uh, an unreasonable belief mm. that you can make it work. Yes. Uh, and so you have to be optimistic. Yes. If without optimism, it's very, very difficult to make something start because you don't sign that lease yes. without optimism. Yes. It has to be there. And then for me, um, what I've seen with the best entrepreneurs is you have to have perspective right? You have a perspective of coming from a place in the world where those opportunities didn't exist, where those opportunities were difficult to make. Yes. And I, I see immigrants all the time becoming better business people 
than people who are native. And the reason for it is because they're used to taking those types of risks. They're willing to take those types of risks. They see the opportunity. And because they want to make a dent in the universe. They yes. want to make a difference. We're used to being uncomfortable. Let's yeah. just put it that way. You're used to being uncomfortable. Worst case scenario, <laughs> everything fails. Uh -huh. I can make it work, you know? Like, I can live on next to nothing and am, can make it work. I am positive of this. I'm going to be a success. I can't tell you what decade, right. but I know I'm going to be one, right? And I right. know I'm going to have failures along the way. And I know things are going to go wrong. And when yeah. they do, I'm going to stand learned. back up and start over again. You're going to learn, yep. right? Yep. It's a, it is one of the... Right behind being a parent. Oh, it's yes. one of the most wonderful journeys I've ever been on. But look at it. You are a parent. You are a parent. Because company is a living thing. Mm -hmm. It's an entity. It has its own character, its own personality. Mm -hmm. Personality of a brand. We say it in our language all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Right? What kind of person, what kind of character it is mm -hmm. that it has. It is your baby, mm -hmm. you know? But it's 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 and the customer, like you say, you have to listen and change. That's a part of relationship. If you're married, you have to listen and change. If mm -hmm. you're a parent, you sure have to listen and change, right? Mm -hmm. It's a part of every relationship. So this is nothing new or different. It's just a different way to do it, mm -hmm. right? As a parent, as a person who's married, or as a customer and an owner, right? Relationship. It's a relationship. No matter where you look, it's all the same. The blueprint is the same, mm -hmm. right? All right. And you're having to convince people to go along with you on the way. You've got somebody helping you on branding, somebody who's helping you maybe in marketing, other people who are involved, the, the, the landlord that agreed to lease to you. The, uh, the, the, there's a, at least in my world, you know, I, I hear of people all the time who tell me, well, I'm self-made. I made it on my own. Mm. And my answer is, I don't know. Um, I know that from my standpoint, it's we, not me. Yeah. That everything that happened to me to get here included you know, the people from my childhood, my teachers, the people who are my partners, the employees who work with me, the person who decided to lease me space in the building. Yes. It's we, not me. And and that thought that you gave a little earlier, that you that you said, you know, you want to feel like you're of something bigger. Mm -hmm. We are of something bigger. The United States is something that you're a part of mm -hmm. that you can be very proud of. Mm -hmm. But building, helping that country build out. Mm -hmm comes from people who are willing to take risks, people who are willing to put everything on the line and say, I'm going to go try to make this work. All great accomplishments come from people just like you, mm -hmm. thinking just like you were thinking, mm -hmm. who took the first step, and it was a scary first step. But in the end, they allowed it to continue to evolve, to continue to develop, and they built something great, which ends up being a part of this great thing we call America. Mm, it is so great. Mm -hmm. The whole thing about America is amazing. I mean, it was built, you know, you see all these documentaries. I'm reading a book about Lincoln, you know, just um, now, and it's amazing, you know. It's amazing the premises this, this country was built on, and it's amazing how it's somehow built into people, like in their hearts and souls here. It's amazing, you know, mm -hmm. it's just amazing. All right, so what are the things that you're most stressed about right now? The things that uh, that you worry about the most in your business? I'm, I'm sure you worry about a lot of things outside of business, especially having a family in Ukraine. I but, worry about that too, yes. Mm -hmm. I worry about my family more than anything. I would say, mm, I cannot say that I'm stressed. Mm -hmm. I just can't, you know. I cannot say it because while there's a certain degree in uncomfortability, Uncomfort being uncomfortable getting outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It is just so exciting, mm -hmm. right? It's so exciting. I mean, we as people create something totally new that wasn't there before, and then you just let it develop, you know, and other people add to it. It's just like, it's like making music, right? Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's all these people and somehow they come up with a masterpiece from so much work and mistakes and this works and it doesn't, cooperation and you learn and something happens and then boom, it's a, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. And I cannot feel stressed right now. It's just too exciting, uh -huh. you know? I mean, God sends me so many beautiful, wonderful people on the way. I can't even, I can't even be stressed because it would be unfair. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing. Everything mm -hmm. is just so wonderful when it comes to it. This is why I think I'm in the right place, mm -hmm. right? Is because somehow that these people willing to help me 
-hmm. and somehow you know there's things that just happen to line up and mm -hmm. it's amazing you know yeah I, and again i have found um you know there are some businesses that succeed and some that don't but there are but entrepreneurs who have that spirit who who are willing to believe who believe that they can make things in fact better it doesn't matter that the one enterprise was successful or not they're able to go build a second one and yeah. then a third one if they mm -hmm. need to because they know that by doing so that 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 they learn from the last one mm -hmm. and they're going to take those lessons forward absolutely absolutely i believe in that in fact um ever Every businessman that's successful, I believe almost everyone is, you know, they have things that failed. They have things that didn't work. It wasn't their first business. There was a couple more before that and they learned and they learned, you know, and, and that's how we all learn. Like I said, you know, you, it's all back to the physicality of it. You run a 5k, yeah. you know, and then it's kind of scary, but you sign up for half marathon, mm -hmm. right? And then it's even more scary. You sign up for marathon, right? And you just keep pushing it meanwhile once you get to that point you can never go back you can never go back to just 5k mm -hmm. it will always feel like hmm, you know i've done it you know mm -hmm. but there's always something about this the new experience right before the race where it's longer than you ever done before but it's doable but you never know how it's gonna work and it could be really good or it could be really bad and until that day you cross that start line, you really never know up until the finish line how it's going to go, mm -hmm. right? So you have that excitement mixed with a little bit of worry, mixed with curiosity, you know? And it's such a good mix that you just want to have it again, mm -hmm. right? This is where you got to keep pushing. And that's why, just like with the physical body, you do that with your man brain, but this is in the form of business, right? Mm -hmm. You just do it with business. Like I was just talking to somebody, he's like, well, this was so successful, but I want to push it like and double the amount of people that work for me. But it's a little bit scary, you know. Meanwhile, this guy is super successful and I just love the feeling. Mm -hmm. I just love it. OK, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and uh, just get your read on them. There are a lot of people who are believing that the United States is on the decline and that other places in the world are on the incline. Um, I happen to uh, obviously the name of the show, The Optimistic American, we believe that things are getting better. But when it comes to America's future, are you optimistic? Oh, I'm optimistic. Why? Oh my gosh, because this country was founded on some on these wonderful principles. And while sometimes it will take maybe a wrong side turn, you know, and then mm -hmm. go back to the main line or where it's supposed to be, it is founded on a solid principles that would always work and people in their hearts, they carry it, you mm -hmm. know, it's there. It's going to be always great. Mm -hmm. How could it not be? All right. There are some people who believe that um, because they have little or nothing, they can't get ahead. Um, do you believe that if people want to get ahead, assuming that they, you know, that they're not severely disabled, that uh, this is a, still a place where they can get ahead? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Even if they are disabled, look at how many people, look at people, people, there's, there's this speaker. He doesn't have arm. He doesn't have legs. He goes and he makes millions of dollars telling people how to live better. You cannot tell me that you cannot do anything. Only thing I ask from my like kid is don't be a victim. Mm -hmm. If you're not a victim, you can make anything work. Mm -hmm. You know, like in the book I read, mm, it said, if cauliflower can be pizza, you can be anything you want to be, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. This country gives you everything you ever can want to become anything you want. You want to be president? Good. Go to school. We'll give you, they give you loans. They give you grants. They give you support. There's tutors. You go to class. You don't understand. You can always call somebody. There's people that your, are waiting to help you. Your child's a daughter, you. right? Mm -hmm. How old is she? 13. 13. Okay. So if you were to give her the lessons, what are the lessons that you hope uh, as a mom that you're able to give her? Well, for one, I always tell her that you have to be thankful, respectful to America and mm -hmm. this kind to Ukraine and America, because Ukraine is what your half of your makeup is and America for the opportunity gave you. I tell her that all the time. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. 
here she can go do anything. You know, she wants gymnastics, we do gymnastics. She wants school, she wants school. She goes to school and she wants to learn this, she can. You know, anything she wants to be, she can do it because in this country, you can. Mm -hmm. You can. There's opportunities everywhere. People will help you, organizations. Look at the country on its own, the most charitable country in the whole world. Americans donate more than anybody else in the whole world. Americans work more than anybody else in the whole we world. Are the most productive country in the world. The most productive, hardworking people. Mm -hmm. How can this country not succeed? It will succeed. There has no other chance, mm -hmm. you know? And the whole spirit of America produces people and attracts people. Like, like look at Elon Musk. He was not American to begin with, but why? He wanted to come to America because he knew this is the country. This is the ground that, that whatever he plants is going to sprout and grow. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. And he made the long journey and he did it. And how many more people? A lot. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you. I think, you know, synonymous with America is opportunity. Yes. This is the place of opportunity. Absolutely. You have to be able to sometimes look up. Instead of continuing to look down, you got to look up. You have to see what those opportunities are. No, you have to work. And you have to work and you have to listen. And then you have to take a risk. Mm -hmm. But if you take the risk, your chances of being successful are dramatically higher here than almost anywhere else in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we're just about at the end of our hour. So I just wanted to say thank you for coming on. Um, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you more in the future. I really will pray for your family. Hope thank that you. all is well in Ukraine. Um, and I also would extend an offer. We have a, uh, I have, I mentor business uh, mm. people, but truthfully, I don't really mentor them. They mentor themselves, but they're all young entrepreneurs um, who all are involved in that opportunity chain at one level or another. Some are, are more successful. Some of them are just starting, trying to figure it out. It's free. There's no, we don't, I just do it because I, I love entrepreneurs. I love their spirit. I love uh, their way of thinking. If you'd like to be involved with it, we'll extend that, our, that offer to you. All right. I would love that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. This is Paul Johnson again uh, here with the Optimistic American. And this was really one of those hopeful conversations. Mm -hmm. But Natalia, before we go, if you would give us again your business name and either give an email address or a phone number so people know how to contact you and what kind of issues they might contact you with. Hmm. Um, thank you for having me mm -hmm. here. It's uh, Stretch Plus, and number is 480-868-8757. And really, you can text me or call me with um, pretty much any sort of issue that you have, you know, physically with your body when it comes to um, may, not something that, you know, I'm not a surgeon, so not something that has to do with, you know, medical involvement, right? But something that physically we can correct, like, you know, you have uh, pain in your back or your knees are hurting. Maybe you're not functioning at 100%. You can always reach out to me at this number and I will personally answer the phone and I will either personally help you or have somebody else from our staff who can help. Well, Natalia, I know with all this energy that you have, you're going to be, have a successful business. Thank you. Thanks again for being here. Paul Johnson, The Optimistic American. Thank you for reading. Thank I very you. Very much appreciate it. You did an awesome job. <laughs> <laughs>